It looked like a person, but I'm convinced it's not a person. I felt that it, uh, what they would call today is an angel. I turned away to say something about how many people there were, and when I turned back, they were gone. They just kind of vanished. I think children do see a lot more than they ever tell us about, and that is slowly educated out of them. I think the presence of the Lord must have been there in the cab of the truck. It became illuminated as if there were a fire under the dash. It's real. It's just what's there that we miss most of the time because we're physical and because we don't have the eyes to see beyond it. They've been given wings is to symbolize rapid movement from place to place, that they are not bound by uh, space and time the way we are. And I personally believe that God, God can do anything. So if he wants to use someone to, to, to comfort someone or give them a message or send an angel, uh, that isn't hard for me to believe at all. It gives me the cold shivers just to feel, to think about it. century to Shakespeare's 16th century, angels are clearly present and recorded throughout history. But today, in our world, even now as I speak, according to several men and women you are about to meet, yes, men and women who insist beyond any reasonable shadow of a doubt that they have come in contact with angels from 10 years old to 79 years old, you will hear incredible stories of men, women, and children who were saved from death or simply comforted and told everything will be okay. Protestants, Catholics, professionals, homemakers have all agreed to come forward to tell their story of what they say are contact with angels. When I was struck, I should have, I really should have died. Mark was um, crushed under 1,700 pounds of steel and, and about to die I, when he says an angel I, appeared I and it. saved him. I even started to cry. Jill was hurt emotionally and very discouraged I, I, until I she says I two angels yeah. prayed with her. Doug was driving a bus full of passengers when he says an angel saved the all their lives. So, you know, are you all right and do you feel all right? Glennon was 10 years then, old when her raft drifted out into the about, ocean. Um, she the says man. the man who saved her never came out of the water. This makes just God's timing. Betty's four-year-old son was in a coma, in about life. to die. A strange visitor God's appeared God's and comforted her. I can imagine. And Don was surrounded by a bright, radiant light in the cab of his truck. Wind were pitching the truck about. You know. We'll also recreate documented angel encounters, one in a Nazi concentration camp and another on a college campus where a co-ed was saved from being raped. Most religions of the world hold to the existence of angels. In most of the English-speaking world, this concept comes from the Christian Bible. We will examine some of the excerpts that describe angels in the Bible, as well as hear from experts and theologians about what God has to say about his created beings. Throughout the centuries, artists have typically depicted angels as gloriously winged creatures who are hovering and keeping watch over us. But for the most part, those who come in contact with angels don't see them that way at all. They typically take on human form and are there one moment and gone the next. That is Mark's story. Mark is 38 years old. Born and raised in Peoria, Illinois, Mark met his angel six months before he sat down with us to tell his story. Uh, I was up in Ventura County working at Newberry Park Hardware. 
and uh, we were resetting some bolt bends. Uh, bolt bends, which were uh, about six foot high, eight shelves, and you had bolts and so forth. If you want, if you go into a hardware store, want two or three bolts, you get your bolt bend out of your pick bends in the front, and then behind it, you had full boxes. Uh, each four foot section held about 1,400 pounds, and we had six of these side by side. And I was standing, I was the only one on this one side of the bend door. And uh, I had three other guys helping me, and I reached up to grab something off the top shelf when I noticed everything starting to collapse on me. Uh, the gondola got off balance. And I told my partner, and he was with me, I said, this is not And I noticed at that time that uh, when I, after I told him to get this off me, I couldn't breathe. And they said, one, two, three, they tried to push this off, they couldn't budge it. I was crushed. And I noticed that there was two other guys that, uh, that came in and tried to help also. Um, one guy in particular had a, a pock-marked face, um, kind of reddish, uh, blondish hair, and an earring that kept going like this, and he had big arms. And he didn't get underneath the, the bolt bends, he just kind of reached over and was going to help these other guys and lift these uh, gondolas off me. And I remember saying to myself, I wish this guy would get underneath the bends and get some leverage because he's not going to get any leverage. Well, to make a long story short, they said one, two, three, and they pushed this guy, <laughs> he lifted the bends off me enough, and then I had a lot of strength, and I, I got out, and I was, got my breath. I walked around a little bit, and I wanted to thank this, this guy for helping me. I asked my partner who that guy was who helped, and he said, well, there's no, there's no guy that helped. And I said, I should. I know there was, and I described the guy. And then I went to the front and I asked Beth, who was the cashier. Uh, there's only one door going in and out of this hard disk. And I said, Beth, who was the guy that came in and helped me? I said, Mark, there's nobody in the store except for you guys and myself and another cashier. There's nobody there. And I knew that guy was there. I could describe him to the T. Never said a word. I just, uh, I just felt that. that wasn't my time to go. I mean, I was crushed. I should have, I really should have died. Um, and I look back, I, I still get a little, I get weak just thinking about it. But I just, I just feel that there's things that, uh, my purpose here on, on this earth um, is still not, it's not completed. And I just felt that that person uh, was sent uh, to save me. It's just, I, I, couldn't, I couldn't even thank this person. I don't know who this person was. Now, do you think this was a person? I don't, I, it looked like a person, but I'm convinced it was not a person. Um, I felt that it, uh, what they would call today is a, an angel uh, that, that saved me. And I'm very thankful for that. And praise God for that. I, I, I'm a, I know I'm a changed person since that day that happened. it up. Is Mark an incredible daydreamer with a life-saving story? Well, most people who know Mark would say, no way. He owns his own successful business and is anything but over-emotional. But we decided to check. And ask his wife, Becky. Becky and Mark have been married for 18 years. He's not a daydreamer, and when he says something, he means it. He does kid around a lot and jokes, and he's known for his jokes. But when he's serious, you better listen, because he, he really means it. In the Bible, David writes in Psalms, God will command his angels to guard you in all your ways. Our next story is a modern-day version of that promise. A rapist was well known to be stalking a college campus. All girls were strictly warned never to walk alone at night. But Karen needed to get from her car to her dorm room. All the while, the rapist waited. This is a true story. Six women have now been raped by a man still eluding police tonight. Police say they have a definite description and are on the lookout. 
The man is about 30 years old, short brown hair, Caucasian, medium build, and around 170 pounds. Police strictly caution all women to never walk alone at night on campus and to avoid going out at all. God, I'm not going to get from my car to the door. The city council approved the new city oh God, protect me. Okay, John, take him to the car. Wait, wait. What? Ask him why... Why he... Why he just let me walk on by. Why? Why'd you let her go? Look, buddy, you can make this a lot easier on yourself. I wasn't about to touch her. Not with those two big guys with her. There wasn't anyone with me. Cute, honey. I saw those guys. But I was alone. Well, whatever he saw... Thank someone. Thank God. Saved you from him. Night, ma'am. Street. 
The story was well publicized. Karen was saved from two angels who allowed themselves to be seen only by the man who waited for her. Another similar story took place in New York City's Central Park. Two police officers came upon a small shack-like building they believed drug dealers were working out of. They busted down the door and much to their surprise, it was filled with many drug dealers all armed with automatic weapons. The two police officers were no match for the many drug dealers. Nervously, they yelled, drop your weapons. And much to their surprise, they did. Later, when asked why so many drug dealers surrendered to the police officers, their leader said there was no way they could take on what they saw as an army of police officers outside of that door. The two police officers were strong in their Christian faith, and they believe the drug dealers saw an army of angels in police uniforms outside of that door. Doug says his angel saved not only his life, but a bus full of lives. This story happened on the Newburyport Turnpike between Boston and Maine 50 years before the time Doug sat down to tell us his story. I left Boston about 12.30 at night, due in Portland, Maine at 2 or 2.10. And it was one of these nights that uh, this thing happened to me, going up. And if you're not familiar with the area, the Newburyport Turnpike, which was a straight road from Boston to Newburyport, but very hilly. Because as the glaciers came down, you know, they leveled off a lot of it and made a lot of hills. And as you come up the hills and go down the other side, in some instances, there are crossroads. Well, on one of the hills, there was an old farmhouse. Almost, it looked like a deserted farmhouse. I'd gone by it many, many times and apparently was deserted. But this night was a black night, no moon. Came by, came up the hill, and as I'm going by, somebody waved to me. The order is, if someone waves you down, you should stop and pick them up. So I stopped. Well, you know, <laughs> driving a bus at night, you, you travel right along, you're not going very slow. You're doing, well, 55, 60, 65 miles an hour, maybe. Come over the hill, and I stopped beyond the house. I came back, you know, I got out of the bus because I waited and no one came. So I got out and walked back to the driveway of the farmhouse. There was no one there. And I looked around and looked around, no one. So I finally got back in the bus, started down the hill, and down near the bottom of the hill is a crossroad. There was a terrific accident had happened at this intersection. Now, if I had gone over that hill, at the rate of speed I was going, there's no way that I would have been able to stop before I hit that wreckage down there. It gives me the cold shivers just to feel it, to think about it. You know, that must have been a guardian angel as he was calling them, you know, because I could have been killed, and not only myself. I would have killed a lot of people because I had a bus full of people. Doug's story has been recorded in a book as an encouragement to future generations. His pastor preached a sermon on angels and their place in our lives. And what was about to happen, no one could have imagined. Right after that sermon, people came out of the woodwork, wanting to tell their stories of angel encounters. The name of the church is Solana Beach Presbyterian Church. The then pastor of 11 years had never preached a sermon about angels before. This day he did, and it changed the people in his church. Dr. Don McCullough was the pastor who preached the sermon. Are there angels here today? What would you say? And I would say absolutely. Uh, we have no reason to believe uh, that uh, God has ceased to use angels if for thousands of years, in the time period recorded in Scripture, God worked through angels. We have no reason to doubt that God still works through angels. 
then of course you have the experiential witness of those who testify to angelic beings in their lives. After I preached the sermon, it was interesting how many people, as you say, came out of the woodwork with their own stories, often very hesitant uh, to talk about it, uh, afraid of what people might think. But when I preached the sermon, it gave them some permission uh, to acknowledge uh, experiences in their lives. I know there's other stories. Joel people have said to me, the education oh. director at the church. It was her idea to gather the stories and compile them into a book called Angels Revealed. All oh, people were so reluctant. They would see me and they would say, I have something for you, but you wouldn't really want it, would you? Or something happened to me, but... We had, I think we had 23, and I was somewhat surprised and pleased, but I'm also convinced there's probably three times as many more stories in this congregation. But people are sure nobody else would be interested or would not believe them. They seem to be very marker events, I would say. Uh, maybe there's only been one incident in their whole life, but they remember it very clearly. If it was a childhood incident, I don't think it's as life-changing because it's taken for granted then. I think children do see a lot more than they ever tell us about, and that is slowly educated out of them. So I don't think it's as life-changing for the child. In reflecting back upon it as an adult, then it can have an effect on the life. They are to do God's bidding. That's why they're called messengers. That's what the word angel means. Uh, they do God's work. I think they do work of protection. Uh, I find myself occasionally when I'm praying for my children, for example, pray very specifically, God, uh, send your angels of protection around my children. Uh, I, I believe they do that. Betty prayed for her little boy. Betty is a devout Catholic and says she and her husband have many times gotten on their knees to pray for their 11 children. 33 years before she needed her prayers answered, her four-year-old son was about to die. Betty is 61 years old. She was born in Bisbee, Arizona and met God's messengers in Glendale, California. 30 years before she sat down to tell us her story. My oldest boy woke up, and he was only about six at the time. Woke my husband, Ron, up and said, Dad, come quick, Chris has a stiff head. <laughs> so to make a long story short, my husband said, oh, get him to the doctor right away. And thank God I have, we had a great doctor. And I, Ron said, I'll go. And I, he had a busy day, and I called the doctor and, and the nurse. I, I think one thing I'd like before I go any further is to stress God's timing in this story because it was the first time in my life that I became aware of God's timing. And by 11 o'clock, we were taking Chris down to Children's Hospital, and he was already going into a coma. And... I'll just never forget it. We knew our little, we knew in our hearts he was dying because the doctors sort of ignored us and we sat all day. They'd come report on one test. Well, it's not, it's not viral. It is bacterial. It's very serious. He was, he was really bad. He didn't move an eyelash for three days. So it was Saturday night, Christmas was on Sunday that year, and um, I was out in the hallway, and this little older lady came up to me and said, uh, I'll be offering my Christmas Mass for your son tomorrow. And she spoke in a very broken English. He called me. Christmas morning and, and said what a beautiful day it was because your little boy opened his eyes and he's fine. And this other doctor said, well, I think somebody much higher than us was in charge of all this and it really wasn't us. And I think more things happen to us than we realize with God's power. And I personally believe that God, God can do anything. So if he wants to use someone to, to, to comfort someone or give them a message or send an angel, uh, that isn't hard for me to believe at all. It isn't hard for me at all. 
So far, all of our stories have God's messengers appearing in human form, sometimes to comfort, sometimes to save. But on some occasions in the Bible, the angels are encompassed by a brilliant light. In Revelation, John saw an angel whose countenance was as bright as the sun, whose feet were pillars of fire. In the Easter story, the angel who rolled the stone away from Jesus' tomb had a countenance as bright as lightning, whose clothes were white as snow. In the course of the sermon, I try to talk about what angels are, that they are uh, the presence of God, spiritual uh, beings that are they're used uh, by God. Uh, but I, and I said, you know, we have absolutely no biblical evidence that there are that angels have wings. Yeah, it's the most controversial thing I said in the entire sermon, uh, because people were very upset about that. Their their images from art and so forth uh, were that all angels had wings, and I said I can't find anything in Scripture. There, uh, there, there are passages that speak about. Uh, the wings of cherubim, but cherubim are different mm -hmm. than angels. And, and I could not find anything that indicated that angels have wings. So I said that. Well, I mean, that was so controversial because people didn't want their images uh, destroyed. I said maybe one reason artistically they've, they've been given wings is to symbolize rapid movement from place to place, that they are not bound by uh, space and time the way we are. Well, it was not long after that that uh, one man of the church came in and told me one, a, a remarkable story of encountering an angel. And he said, I have to tell you, the angel had wings. And it was a vivid, vivid uh, uh, image that he had of an angel. Angels in scripture can appear as human beings. In fact, they're often confused uh, with human beings. You read about stories where the angels encountered Abraham, he thinks they're strangers walking in. Um, apparently they can assume certain forms, human forms. Uh, the scripture also speaks of radiant light with angels. Um, but I personally, to my knowledge, have never seen one, so um, I don't know. I think they vary in, in appearance. Don says he saw a bright light in the cab of his truck after a man he never saw before in his small hometown and never saw again deeply affected his life. Don was 60 years old at the time he sat down with us to tell us his story. His story happened 35 years earlier when he was 25 in his hometown of Cushing, Oklahoma. I was uh, driving a gasoline truck working my way through college. I had a wife, small children, and uh, took this uh, load of gasoline down to a small little town, even smaller than my hometown of Cushing. And uh, I pulled in, unloaded my load of uh, gasoline. As it was draining, I went in and started figuring the bill and talked to the proprietor of the service station. And uh, he was an older man. I was at that time much younger. and. Uh, I naturally had uh, respect for older people, and uh, he started making comments that were very un untoward, I guess is the way to put it. Uh, left me kind of feeling edgy, and uh, a couple of teenage girls walked by. Uh, he looked at them and made a very derogatory comment toward those girls, and it, it just kind of shocked me. Uh, I'm no prude. I was in the service, and I've been around pipeliners and truck drivers all my life. The truck itself started behaving funny. And uh, I'd driven that truck for many miles over the previous year and a half. Uh, and I started feeling funny. Uh, my uh, flesh started creeping. And uh, so I pulled off the side of the road uh, with this big gasoline truck. And uh, as I did, the truck really started to behave erratically. It shook, literally shook, as if it were in the wrong gear or cutting out or something. It, it wasn't that. It was different, but somehow that was uh, my first thought. And as I sat there, the thoughts just started flooding like a waterfall. Uh, I think the presence of the Lord must have been there in the cab of the truck. It 
became illuminated as if there were a fire under the dash of the truck. And uh, I turned the engine off. It continued to shake, uh, just a vibration as if a giant wind were pitching the truck about. You know. And I read uh, not long after that in Luke 12th chapter, uh, long about verses 6 and 10, 6 to 10. Something about, if you acknowledge me before others, this was Jesus talking, then I will acknowledge you before the angels who are going to report it to God was, was the assumption left in, in the gospel there. And I have a feeling it has some connection to that. Don says he needed comforted and assured God was on his side. Jill's story is much the same. She was distressed and in deep emotional need. David writes in Psalms, the angel of the Lord will encamp around you and deliver you. Jill needed comforted. When she believes two angels appeared and then just as quickly disappeared. Jill was born in Chicago and was 51 years old when she sat down with us to tell us her story. She says she encountered her angels seven years earlier in Grandview, California. Well, when I was at um, a church with a regular prayer meeting that had uh, it was taking place there, and I really needed prayer. I was very, very, I was really hurting a lot, but I was very stubborn and I didn't want to be vulnerable, you know, I didn't want to admit my need, whatever. When I finally did and I went over to the section where I was supposed to do, go to be prayed for, it was so crowded, many, many people were there praying for other people and there was no one there to pray for me. I was almost ready to go home because I could see it would be a long wait. And two ladies came up to me and I thought they wanted to have prayer. So I explained to them that everybody was really busy and they couldn't pray for anybody, you know, there was nobody left to pray. And they said, no, we're here to pray for you. They were so just really calm and loving, and they um, made me feel so comfortable that I did pray with them. I explained to them what I needed, and they, um, I, I even started to cry, which I just don't do. I'm such a hard person, you know, I mean, I, I don't do that very often. And I, I really cried, and I felt so clean and fresh from that. And uh, as I was talking to them, I turned away to say something about how many people there were. And when I turned back, they were gone. They just kind of vanished. And they couldn't have gotten out easily because we were in among hundreds of people. They were just so packed there. Well, I really think they were angels. They uh, were right there. I mean, I w was in such a place where I needed someone to, to minister to me. And you know how if, you, if you're in that kind of a situation and no one is there to do that, you get a little harder, you get a little, you're more hurt. You go away more hurt than, than healed and helped. And uh, I, I really think that God knew that I needed someone to, to, to love me and for me. Many angel stories were recorded during war times when great needs arise all over the world. In Billy Graham's book, Angels, God's Secret Agents, he tells the story he was told while visiting American troops during the Korean War. A small group of Marines were trapped and freezing to death in 20 degree below zero temperatures. They had nothing to eat for six days and were about to surrender to the opposing army. One man, a Christian, started reciting Bible verses and taught the men a praise song of God. Then they heard a loud crashing noise and a boar came running toward them. One of the men raised his rifle to shoot, but the boar killed over, it was dead. The men feasted on the meat and regained their strength. The next morning, they heard another noise and they were convinced the opposing forces had found them. When they looked up, they saw a Korean man who spoke perfect English, very rare for that time. The man said, follow me. And he led the Marines through the mountains and through the forest until they could cross into their own lines. When they looked up to thank the man, he was gone. 
Another well-known author, Corey Ten Boom, tells the story of when she specifically prayed for angels during World War II in a Nazi concentration camp. polite one. Over there. Say now quickly. I I will hide my Bible. No. Come back later. No, Corey, no. Let's see. It will be all right. It'll be fine. The Lord is busy answering our prayers. We will not have to make the sacrifice of all our clothes. Come on, you two. Over here. Come on. Take off your clothing. Put it here and into the shower. Oh, 
boy, she will be killed. Lord, <gasps> let now thine angels to surround me, and let them not be transparent, for the guards must not see me. <laughs> under her dress. She'll be punished. Next room! Ravensbrook, unseen, clutching the Bible beneath her prison gown. Something blocked the view of all the guards at every single checkpoint. Was it the angels she specifically prayed for? Was she surrounded by angels in prison uniforms or even Nazi uniforms? She recorded her answer prayer for angels as an encouragement to future generations. She said, quote, O oh Lord, if thou dost so answer prayers, I can face even Ravensbrook unafraid. Many believe in guardian angels. That belief comes from Jesus' words in the Bible, do not look down on these little ones, there, angels in heaven, always see the face of my Father. And Paul the Apostle writes, we have angels watching over us. Was it a guardian angel who saved a 10-year-old girl who was about to die? Glennon was swimming on a raft with a friend in the ocean when she says an angel appeared and saved them. Glennon was only 10 years old when she says that she met her angel in the Pacific Ocean. Nikki and I, the, the one that was my age and I, were floating around in a raft. We'd just eaten lunch and Matthew, her big brother, was pulling us around in this raft. And um, he kind of left us and went off to do his own thing. And we're just sitting there. And I don't remember this period of time from when he left and when we realized that we had drifted way, way out. Um, we were out toward the buoys, which are you know, quite far out. We weren't that far out, but it was getting to be where we were past where the, the waves were crashing and we didn't know how to get back in. We were only 10 years old. But we suddenly looked up and the beach was very far away and the people on the beach were very small. And we started waving and waving, and it was one of those days when there's no lifeguard there and you're supposed to watch your own kids. Nikki's mom um, started to swim out toward us. Um, and you know, as we're waiting for her to come out, we're, Nikki starts to cry, and I, so I get out of the raft to see if, we can, if I can touch the bottom. I'm thinking, oh, we're not that far out. And I remember thinking of you know, Jaws and all kinds of scary thoughts like that. And I scrambled back in the raft. And then we realized there's a hole in the raft. And the air is slowly going out of the raft. And so we're, we were just so scared, these little girls out there. And um, Mrs. Quine finally swam out to us. She was in pretty good shape and a really good swimmer. And this other man that we had never seen came. I remember we were sitting facing the beach like this. And this man came from the left, from that direction. And um, he was, I'd say, 30, 35 years old, in great shape. You know, he wasn't a huge man, but he was a good swimmer. He was, um, just looked like an average, pretty handsome guy that you'd see on the street. So um, the two started helping us, um, you know, out of the raft and swimming. And I just remember going under and coming up in all the salt water and trying to breathe and trying to swim. And we knew how to swim, but it was to the point where we were getting tumbled and, and crashing under these waves. Our bathing suits were coming down, and um, we were just hanging on to Mrs. Quine and this man that we didn't know. And he was very comforting. I never knew his name, but he was—he would hold us, and we, you know, we touched him. Finally, we 
were up on the beach. I don't remember the, the whole process. I just remember it seemed like it was forever and I thought I was going to die. And we came up on the beach and we're pulling our bathing suits up and three of us came out of the water. It was Mrs. Quine, um, Nikki and I. And everyone on the beach was, first it was, um, you know, the excitement and the adrenaline of they're okay and here they are and are you, you, know, are you all right and do you feel all right? And then one of the little kids started screaming about um, the man and everyone saw four people out there and we knew that there were four people, you know, this man was with us and he never came out of the water. These are just a few of many stories. Frankly, when we began to search for these stories, we thought we'd have to comb the globe to find just a few. Instead, we found pages after pages. You saw just a small percentage of them. Angels are mentioned 300 times in the Bible. The stories throughout history are innumerable. Stories, but truth, according to those who tell them. What would you say about it to somebody who would say, you're nuts, you're a dreamer, you're, you've made it all up in your mind, uh, you were unconscious and you dreamed that it just really didn't happen. A lot of skeptics will say, Mark, come on. I was wide awake. Um, you know, I, I, have, I have good integrity. I'm not bragging on myself. I have good integrity and credibility. Um, I'm, I'm not a person who would make something like this up. Um, if I was to tell this to somebody close to me, they would, they would believe me in a, in a heartbeat. Um, the only I can tell you is it, it is real. There's no way you can make something like this up and describe somebody because I've that, that, that's described and etched in my mind. Um, these aren't crazy things that could, could happen. I, I'm, I'm sitting here to tell you that this actually could happen. It's, 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 it's Do you believe your husband saw an angel that day? Oh, yes. And I really believe he's had other angels throughout the years in uh, driving the car when he's come home and told me I should have been gone today, I should have died today in a car accident and I saw it happen. Is this something just for him or for anybody? Have no, you seen an angel? It's for, it's for anybody. I, I don't think that I've had an angel with me yet. I've, I have felt close to God and to his presence, but I don't feel that I've been in a life and death circumstance like he has a couple of times during his life and that he actually saw this angel. No, I've never had that experience, but I hope I do when that time comes. Now, these people are just dreaming and make-believing things. What would your answer to that be? Well, all I could say is I actually saw one. I saw this being on the ground waving to me to stop. Actually, his signal meant for me to stop. It's not my imagination because my imagination is not that vivid, you know. But I actually saw it. I actually saw it. It's very powerful, and yet I just think it's, it's real. It's, it's real. It's just what's there that we miss most of the time because we're physical and because we don't have the eyes to see beyond it. And we're only given glimpses of it. So it, it doesn't give me the, that, the goose pimply feeling as much anymore. It just, it makes sense more than being an emotional thing. What would you say to someone, and not even specifically about your case, but just in general, come on, Jill, you and everyone else are daydreaming. I mean, you know, you're just in fantasy land, you're in la-la land, there aren't, there, there aren't any such thing as angels. Get in touch with reality here. What would you say to that? Well, I guess there's different levels of reality. And for me, where I am right now in my life, and how the ways I've seen God work and, and uh, touch people and change lives, He's done that for me, and uh, he does work through angels. I, I says that in the Bible, and I really believe that. It was, it was a friend of Chris's, my boy that was spared. It was his one of his best friends. In fact, they're still friends. And um, he was up north and was coming down San Marcos Pass, and his little V-dub bugs spun out, and he, the car flipped over, and he was thrown. He's a big guy. And, um, and his dog was with him. And he said when he woke up, that there was, he was covered with a blanket, and there was a man standing there. And the man didn't really say very much to him. And the dog didn't bark, and the dog didn't growl. Or, and, he, and afterwards, he said that struck him 
how the dog was so quiet. And then when he came to a little more, by that time the police had come and the ambulance, you know, he said the man was just gone. And he says, I still have the blank. Any type of common thread in these stories at all? Uh, uh, well, certainly the one of help. The one, the, I think a lot of the stories, it's the person ha is potentially in harm's way. And that for some reason, I don't know why God chooses to intervene for them and not others. You know, accidents do happen and people do get killed. So why, for instance, does the bus driver with his load of people get detained and thus avoid an accident? when a mile away or, you know, a state away, another bus has an accident. I don't know. Why, though? Um, is there a purpose for that bus driver? Was there a certain purpose for somebody on the bus that had to be saved? I don't know. But you can, you, you can wonder, can't you? Yeah. yeah. And certainly the theme is there of saving, of, of intervening in an unusual way to save. And then the other strong theme is encouragement. And I think that the encouragement theme reveals itself in many ways in everyone's life. And we just need eyes to see it. Will we always know when we come in contact with an angel? No, I don't think so. Scripture says many of you have entertained angels unawares. Uh, no, I don't think we will. I really don't. And what does that scripture mean? Well, in that context, the writer uh, was saying... Uh, be good to strangers, be hospitable, <laughs> because you never know who that stranger may be. What might an example be? A homeless person? A Could person be. at the mall? Could be. I mean, who knows? According to the Bible, God has created angels, and they are at His command, sent by Him to us to intervene. One of the many ways they say God reaches out to us. I think you'll see another angel someday. I hope I do. I'd, I'd love to meet the angel that saved my life. I'd love to just say thank you. I, I just like, I don't even know his name. I just, like, I just simply like to thank you. Like if, you if you saved my life, I would really like to thank you. And I think you would do the same for me. I felt bad that I couldn't thank you, God. So I thank the Lord until hopefully sometime I can thank this, this angel. And I, I mean, I know that that was an angel. I know that the spiritual and the physical realms can mesh and they can, and, and the spiritual realm is so much greater that it encompasses the physical realm. I know, I know for a fact that that was real.